As Moses spoke his final instructions to the children of Israel, he recited their history from the time God took them out of Egypt. He wanted them to remember that God is the one who brought them out of Egypt and led them in the wilderness. He reminded them that these 40 years were to humble and to test the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 8 verse 2. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you, to know that what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Now it seems odd in, to us in this name it and claim it era of church doctrine that God would, wouldn't just do everything that the children of Israel asked him to do. Now how did God humble and test his people? What was the purpose of God humbling and testing them? And does God still humble and test his people? I'm Dan Cathcart and this is Shadows of the Messiah. God said that the experiences that they had in the wilderness were too humble and to test them. What experiences was God referring to? Now one of them was to feed them when they were, ran out of food. Let's look at Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. In this particular situation, God humbled the children of Israel, seeking to teach them that their nourishment comes from the word of God. Moses said this was accomplished by giving them manna, which their fathers did not know. God did not give them the foods that they were used to, the pots of meat and the abundance of bread. That, so when they hungered, when they asked for food, what they asked for was what was familiar with them. Look at Exodus 16, verse 3. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the fill. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. God gave them quail in the evening to satisfy their hunger for meat. But then he gave them something new and unfamiliar. Exodus 16, verses 13 through 15. So it was that the quails came up at evening and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. God gave them a food that they did not know, provided directly from God's word that he spoke to Moses. Look at Exodus 16, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Not only was it unfamiliar, they would receive it just once a day. Exodus 16, verse 16. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. One omer for each person, according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. Each day they had to trust God that the manna would be there. Those who tried to store it up received a big surprise when it rotted overnight. When Satan tempted Yeshua in the wilderness, Yeshua quoted from this passage about the manna. Matthew 4, verses 3 and 4. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 
Yeshua could have trusted in himself and provided for himself bread to eat. The temptation is to rely on what his flesh says that he needs instead of relying on God to provide it. The children of Israel were allowed to become hungry so that they would learn to go to God, not in anger or desperation, but in confidence and gratitude for God's provision. Not only did God provide manna for the children of Israel, their clothes and their shoes did not wear out. Look at Deuteronomy 8 verse 4. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these forty years. Through this provision of the manna, God was instructing His people how to rely on and trust in Him. Deuteronomy 8 verse 5. Keep in mind this thought, that as a son is trained by his father, so you have been trained by the Lord your God. Some translations use the word chasten or discipline instead of train. The Hebrew word is number 3256, yasser, meaning to chasten, instruct, or correct. Isaiah uses this same Hebrew word to compare God's words and instructions with the knowledge of a farmer on how and when to plant. Isaiah says that they are to listen and to hear his speech because it is instruction in right living. Isaiah 28, 23 through 26. Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the cloths? When he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin? Plant the wheat in rows, the barley in the appropriate place, and the spelt in its place? For he instructed him in right judgment. His God teaches him. So God giving the children of Israel manna in the wilderness is God's way of instructing them to rely on and to trust him, to believe that God would do what he said he would do. Moses described their lack of belief that God could or would do what he said he would do for them 39 years earlier when they refused to enter the promised land. Look at Deuteronomy 1, 30-32. The Lord your God, who goes before you, will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the ways that you went until you came to this place. Yet for all that, you did not believe the Lord your God. Even though God had taken them out of Egypt and caused them to cross the Red Sea on dry land, appeared to them in the fire on Mount Sinai and gave them manna to eat and water to drink, they did not believe God to do what he said he would do. They did not believe that God had the power to defeat the Canaanites. The children of Israel had totally failed to learn what God intended for them to learn through their trials. God said that the reason he humbled and tested his people was to know what was in their hearts. They were supposed to have God's Torah written on their hearts. Deuteronomy 6 verse 6. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. God wanted to know if the children of Israel believed enough to follow what he said to do, to live according to his ways. Deuteronomy 5 verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. David asked God to examine him in order to find out what is inside of him. Psalm 26, verses 1 through 3. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. David's proof of what is in his heart is that he has trusted in the Lord. 
He goes on to say that he hasn't worshipped idols or walked in the ways of the wicked. Instead, he constantly speaks and sings about God and worships only God. In other words, he keeps God's commandments. Through the trials that David faced, he learned to believe in and to trust in God. This is the heart that God wants his people to have. This is the kind of belief that leads to salvation. This is the belief that the Ethiopian that Philip spoke to demonstrated. Look at Acts 8 verses 35 through 37. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yeshua says that salvation comes when people accept that God has the power and commitment to do what he says he will do. The children of Israel continually doubted God, and in their doubt, they proclaimed that God brought them out to kill them, as we read earlier in Exodus 6 or 16, verse 3. But God brought them out not to kill them, he brought them out of Egypt because he loved them. Deuteronomy 10, verse 15. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all people, as it is this day. Yeshua tells us God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. Do you believe it? Or do you believe that he only wants to kill you? Look at John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. God did not send Yeshua into the world to bring death. Although, like death comes to those who didn't believe in the wilderness, death comes to those who don't believe that God sent his Son. Those in the wilderness thought they believed in God. They did follow him out of Egypt, now, however, when trials came, they fell away, and God became angry. Look at Hebrews 3, verses 17 through 19. Now with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, those whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Belief is not a passive or weak thing. When it's in our hearts, we can do anything that God wants us to do. This is why Paul tells us to glory in trials that we face. Look at Romans 5, 3 through 5. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Yeshua told a parable about four types of soil into which the sower planted seeds. The seeds that fell on the stony ground immediately sprouted and grew, but when the sun shined on it, it quickly withered and died, Matthew 13, 20 through 21. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. The person who hears and receives it with joy but doesn't have the word deeply embedded in his heart is at risk of withering away. Paul quotes Moses' instructions to the children of Israel that the word is near to them. 
in their hearts so that they may do the word. Romans 10, 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. God allows adversity and challenges to come into our lives so that we will be humble. He wants us to recognize that the good things that come into our lives are not because of our own efforts or righteousness, but that they come because of our faith, our belief in Him and His devotion to His people. He wants us to have such a strong belief in Him that nothing can shake our faith. He wants to know what is in our hearts. Will we walk in His ways or not? Thanks for watching today. I'm Dan Cathcart, and this has been Shadows of the Messiah. Shalom and be blessed.